October 13th, 1939. You've seen Poland gobbled up, split by two powerhouses, and one of those has since turned its attention to small countries in your neck of the woods. And when it turns its attentions your way, what do you do? Well, if you're Finland, you say no. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the last significant Polish unit surrendered and the German and Soviet invasion of Poland is complete. A new Polish government is set up in exile, even as tens of thousands of Polish soldiers manage to escape their homeland. In China, the fighting for Changsha comes to an end with a Chinese victory. It is the first major Chinese city that has managed to defeat the Japanese. In the Baltics, Latvia agrees to allow the Soviet Union to use their military bases to spare themselves from an occupation. Now on the 10th, Lithuania signs a 15-year mutual assistance pact with them. This allows the USSR to have 20,000 soldiers on Lithuanian bases. On the 12th come talks between the Finns and the Soviets. The Finns have already mobilized, being a bit leery of Joseph Stalin's intentions. He now has a list of demands for them. They must lease the Hanko Peninsula to the USSR and allow them to build a base there for 5,000 Soviet troops plus personnel and also give over control of several islands in the Gulf of Finland. They also must give over part of the Rybaki Peninsula up near Murmansk and the port of Petsamo up there. There are nickel mining operations up there, Stalin had his eye on. The Finnish Soviet border in the Karelian Isthmus should be moved to a point 20 miles east of Vipori and existing fortifications in Karelia destroyed. In exchange, the Finns will get a big chunk of northern Karelia. Stalin says he's worried about an attack from the Gulf of Finland or the Finnish mainland, and all this is for his country's security. But what this would mean in real terms is that the Finns would have to abandon their main defense, the Mannerheim Line. And the Finnish government, most of it anyhow, think that these demands, as harsh as they are, are just the beginning. And the next demands the Finns would be powerless to resist if they accept these ones, since then they'd have lost their main physical defense lines. But is Stalin being outrageous or somewhat realistic? I mean, he really does believe that Germany will turn on the Soviet Union if they achieve dominance in Western Europe. And while Leningrad, even when it was St. Petersburg, has never been attacked across Karelia successfully, if anyone would or could try to do it, it would be the Wehrmacht. He also has as a personal goal, the reconquest of the former territories of the Russian empire that are no longer part of the USSR. Well, whatever the case, whether he is actually proposing things in good faith or trying to undermine the Finns or both, his demands are serious and he is dismayed by the Finns' total rejection of the idea, for example, of giving Stalin a base at Hanko on the Finnish mainland at the mouth of the Gulf of Finland. To him, the stubborn and unrealistic stance adopted by the Finns appeared as both perverse and downright suspicious. Surely the Finns must have had some kind of hidden motive for adopting such a provocative and belligerent policy. And since Finland's own armed forces were so weak, that hidden motive might well be a secret alliance with Hitler. But Hitler has not been meeting with the Finns, though he is meeting with a Swede. On the 9th, he received Swedish businessman Birja Dollers, who has been going between London and Berlin through Sweden with a proposal for a negotiated peace with Britain. It originated with Hermann Goering, actually. Well, Dollarus says the British insist on restoring Polish statehood as one major condition. Hitler sends Dollarus back to say that those territorial gains are Germany's right, since they have to now fortify their border with Russia, and that Germany also wants back its pre-World War I colonies or a suitable substitute, and that is a lot of land. Thing is, that day, Hitler issues directive number six, saying, should it become evident in the near future that England, and under her influence France also, are not disposed to bring the war to an end, I have decided, without further loss of time, to go over to the offensive. This will be an attack across the Low Countries designed to defeat the British and French who arrive to help the Dutch and Belgians. And the ground that is to be taken is to protect the Ruhr and its industry. So it's pretty limited if you compare it with Germany's Schlieffen plan to defeat France in World War I. There is no mention of trying to defeat that nation here, for example, but it's still an attack. However, this is also another blow to the autonomy of the German army. 
They feel that although it is within Hitler's authority to order an attack to be prepared, the army should decide where and how that attack should proceed. The next day at the Chancellery, Hitler meets with some of his senior army commanders. He reads a memorandum which gives Germany's goal of the war as the destruction of the power and ability of the Western powers ever again to oppose the state consolidation and further developments of the German people in Europe. He explains that the German treaty with the Soviet Union makes it possible to attack Britain and France, since the war would now only have one front, unlike World War I. However, time is of the essence, since Hitler does not believe any neutrality pact with the USSR can be relied on for too long. He and Stalin seem to have a pretty mutual distrust. Hitler wants to attack in the West already now in the autumn of 1939. And there would be men to fight, for on the 7th, the British Expeditionary Force completes its crossing to France unopposed. The Germans are trying to engage the British this week, though, at sea. On the 7th, the Gneisenau, one of two Scharnhorst-class battleships, the Scharnhorst being the other, leads a naval move on Norway, hoping to draw in British naval units that Luftwaffe bombers could then take out. This does not meet with success. The Scharnhorst ships are also referred to as battle cruisers, by the way. When they were built in 1935, they marked the beginning of Germany's abandoning the naval disarmament imposed by the Treaty of Versailles. They were launched in 1936 and commissioned into the fleet earlier this year. As for Norway, this week Grand Admiral Erich Reder talks to Hitler for the first time about the idea of invading Norway to secure naval and submarine bases. Meanwhile in Britain, Winston Churchill is arguing for mining the Norwegian coastal waters to mess up Germany's iron ore traffic. There is more going on at sea this week. On the 10th, the pocket battleship Graf Spee, flying a French flag, boards the British steamer Huntsman and captures secret merchant navy ship routing documents. This week, the first German aircraft shot down by a British aircraft this war is a Dornier flying boat, shot down on patrol over the North Sea. Also, and notably, on the 8th, U-47 leaves Kiel under Gunther Prien on what will become one of the most brazen naval missions in history. At the end of the week, on the 13th, using stunningly good navigational skill, he has navigated the Orkneys and threaded his way through Britain's boom and net defenses guarding their main naval base at Scapa Flow and has entered it. He is still undetected, though he has surfaced as the week ends. The Polish Navy is in Scotland as well. Actually, already back on August 30th, two days before the German invasion of Poland began, the Peking Plan was initiated by the British Royal Navy. They convinced Polish commander Edward Ridge Smigwi and Admiral Josef Unrug to order at least part of the Polish fleet out of the Baltic. When the destroyers Buzia, Grom, and Buskawica, Storm, Thunder, and Lightning, received the radio message, Peking, 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 they set out for British waters, arriving safely on September 1st. As for the Polish submarine division, I'll get to that next week. Oh, the foreshadowing. In terms of the Polish army, or air force, escaping the Germans and the Soviets, though, about 100,000 troops and 10,000 airmen, with about 300 planes, managed to make it to Romania, Hungary, or the Baltics. These guys will be the basis for the Polish army and air force in exile. Some civilian planes made it as far as Sweden. Lot, the Polish national airline, pulled off the feet of evacuating all their planes, machine tools, and plant equipment to Bucharest, along with 300 personnel. And here are two notes to end the week. On the 12th, Adolf Eichmann starts deporting Jews from Austria and Czechoslovakia to German Poland, while back on the 9th, Philipp Bule sent out forms from the German Chancellery to all hospitals and doctors, for statistical purposes, to index all patients that are senile, criminally insane, or just not of German blood. Three assessors will then meet and decide whether these people shall live or die. And that was the week. The Finns refusing Stalin, Hitler planning an impending attack in the West, and both sides thinking about Norway. Finland, as a sovereign nation, has the right to refuse anyone else's claims or demands on its territory. But Joseph Stalin is not just anyone. He has a paranoid streak. But then again, while he thinks neutrality with Germany won't last, neither does Adolf Hitler. And just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't after you. He also has territorial ambitions. So his fear of a German attack and his desire for expansion combine as he turns his focus to the north. And what does that mean for Finland? Well, whatever it is, 
It's not going to be good, and it's going to involve a lot of people dying. And speaking of former Russian territory, you can click here to watch our Between Two Wars episode about the Russian Civil War. And please support us at patreon.com or timegoes.tv. Your support is what makes this show exist. See you next time. (laughs) 